Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm going to show you everything you need to know about camera tracking in Blender. Now this is the scene we're going to be making, but you can also use this to make all sorts of awesome CGI, special effects sort of scenes. Let's jump into it. The first thing you'll need is a video clip to track, and you can use this clip that I'm going to include in the description below. So you can see it's quite shaky. And an important thing to notice is that there are no camera tracking markers. So a lot of the time when you see people make stuff like this, they'll print out these small uh, paper rectangles or circles with high contrast points like black and white. But I'm going to show you that you don't need that to have effective camera tracking. All you need is a scene with stationary objects that have some texture to them. So here we're going to use this seat and this wooden panel and that's going to be more than enough to set up our tracking in Blender. Now, open up Blender and go to the Motion Tracking window. And you can do that up there. And what it does is open up this set of windows that's perfectly designed for camera tracking. We're going to open up our clip down here. You can see that it's now loaded into our window. I'm going to just make these smaller so that we have more room to play around with. Just bear in mind that I do have screencast keys up here, so you can see what I'm pressing. If I press some random keys, they should come up, uh, they should come up, up there. So if we play this through, you'll see that it's going to end around frame 250, because that's where Blender ends animations by default. But that's not enough for our whole scene, so you can see that it goes on after frame 250. What we'll do now is find the last frame of the animation which by dragging through, and it's around here. So I'm going to press left and right to find the exact last frame that it ends on, and it's 484. So I'm going to change the last frame to 484, and now it plays for the whole way through. Now, if we go back here and press Alt-A to animate, you'll see that this playhead, as it scrubs through the video, it makes the video behind it this darker purple color. That's because it's loading that part of the video into RAM. And so you can see that only some of the video is loaded into RAM. The rest is a lighter color, and so it's not loaded into memory. And so it's going to find it easier to track this part compared to the other part. Luckily, we can increase the amount of RAM that Blender uses, and that should let us load more of the video into RAM, if not all of it. So let's go to File, User Preferences, System, scroll down, and here under Sequencer slash Clip Editor, Memory Cache Limit, we're going to increase this so that Blender can use more RAM. Now I'm using a Mac Pro with 64 gigs of RAM, so I can use as much as I want really, 32,000. But this is going to depend on your computer. You don't want to use up all the RAM on your computer because you want to leave some for your operating system and other programs. Anyway, this will be enough for me. It's going to make sure that the whole scene can be loaded into RAM. The shortcut for this is P. And what that's going to do is load the whole clip, or as much of it as it can, into memory. You can see that the purple bar filled up the whole track. And so now the whole thing is in memory, and the whole thing is going to track really nice and smoothly. So let's get started with the actual tracking. Now, the way you do that is really simple. Let's go back to the first frame with Shift left, and let's Control and left click on a feature. So Control and left clicking creates a new tracking point. And now let's press Control T to track that point. But you can see that it doesn't go very far. So it tracks it for the first few frames, but then it sort of disconnects. And that's because the settings for the marker weren't quite right. So let's play around with those. Let's delete this marker and go back to the first frame again. So these settings over here on the left are the settings that Blender is going to use to create our markers. The first one is pattern size. If you make this bigger, it's going to make a bigger marker. So when you add a larger marker with a bigger pattern size and track it, it should be more stable. But actually, you can see that this broke much earlier. It only tracked for two frames. The reason that is is because we didn't change the search size to match. We more than doubled the pattern size, so let's more than double the search size and create a marker again with Control left clicking and track with Control T. And you can see that this time it tracks it better and it's more stable. So if we go to the first frame 
and animate, we can see what this looks like. If we press L, that locks Blender onto this tracking point. So now when we press Alt A to animate, it gives us a much better idea of how stable it is because it'll look like it's stationary if it's correct. So that's a pretty stable track. We're going to add a few more of these and track them all. So you don't have to do them one by one. You can control left click, left click, left click, and look for high contrast points in your scene. So here, these wooden dark brown splodges are perfect because they're a contrast from the surrounding wood. So Blender should be able to track them very well. Now I'm going to press C and open up this bubble. And I'm going to left click and drag and select all of these points that I just made. Now if I press Control T, it's going to track them all. And you can see that most of them it tracks quite well. There are some points that it doesn't track very well. So if you scrub through, you can see that this one disconnects really early. So I'm just going to delete it. And then another one. This one also disappears. But the other ones stay and they track really well up until they cut off because of the camera. Now, there are parts of the scene that appear later on, and they're only visible in the last part of the animation. And that's no problem. We're going to go to the last frame of the animation with shifts right, and we'll create some markers here. But now to track them, we're going to press Control, Shift, and T, and this tracks backwards. So instead of tracking forwards one frame at a time, it's going to go backwards until it can't track them anymore. So you can see that when they get obscured by this pillar, they stop being tracked. Now, you might think it's a problem because these markers aren't being tracked for the whole animation. But actually, it's OK. You can have a set of markers at the beginning and a different set of markers at the end. And you can even have multiple sets of markers. The only important thing is that at every point, there are eight different markers present in your scene. But we're going to add much more than that to make it really nice and stable. Now, all the markers we've used so far are lock, which stands for location. And they've been OK so far. But I find that later on, once you go to figure out the camera motion, they can be problematic. And it helps to have a better motion tracker. We're going to change this motion type to perspective. And I find that when you go to solve the camera motion, which we'll do in a second, they give you a much better, more stable result. So let's add one of these here now and press Control shift t to track it backwards and see what it looks like. Now, the way perspective works is instead of tracking a single thing right in the middle, it looks at the whole area inside it, and it tries to mark, and it tries to track that. So you can see that even though the outside of the box is wiggling around, the point in the middle will always be very stable. So if I press Alt-A, and it's locked now, which you can do with L, you can see that it's very stable. But it's not quite stable enough. It gets cut off here before it needs to. So let's see if we can fix that by normalizing. And this means that even if the lighting conditions in your scene change, it won't cause any problems. So now that it's normalized, let's Control and left click again, and then Control Shift T to track it backwards. We'll press L to lock. And now we can watch it track backwards to see if it gives us a better result. So you can tell already that this perspective motion tracker is taking longer to track, but I think it's well worth it. So this is around the point where the last one broke, and you can see that this one isn't breaking. It's going right until the pillar gets in the way. Now, if you press Alt-A to animate it, you can see that it's stable throughout the whole of that part of the video. So let's add a few more of these perspective tracking points. Now, the reason it's moving when we click is because it's still locked. So we're going to press L to unlock. I'll delete these two because they were just for examples. And now we're going to add some more. I'm going to make them go towards the right because that'll help them stay in our scene throughout the whole video. Now I'm going to press C. This is going to let me circle, select. And now all of the new ones are selected. I'm going to press Control shift t to track them all at once backwards. So they're being tracked right until the very last frame before the pillar cuts them off. And that's great. There's even this marker, which is tracked throughout the whole 
animation. Actually, both of these are tracked almost for the whole animation. And this is a perfect demonstration of why the perspective trackers are more stable than location, because you can see these ones we tracked with location earlier on from the start of the animation going forwards. And you can see that they just stopped, even though they didn't have to. So around here, they were still on screen. They stopped being tracked. That's these two markers. So I'm going to delete them. And I'm going to replace them with location, with perspective ones, sorry. They seem to be these two markers, which track almost all the way to the beginning. The bottom one doesn't last all the way. It cuts off a few frames beforehand, but that's OK. The only way around that would be to create larger markers, and that'll take much longer to track. So I'm going to add some more points and track them. So again, you can see that these are really stable. Even if the edges look like they're moving around, so let's select this and play it forward. You can see that if we lock it, it actually stays really stable, even though the edge points are all wiggling around. And it looks like it's, it's really unstable, but actually it's really stable. So that's awesome. We have a lot of really good points now. Hmm. Let's get some of these points down there. Perfect. It helps sometimes to go through and create points one by one, because you can make sure that it's nice and stable every time. So I'm just going through Control, left clicking on different points, then pressing Control T to track until the marker goes out of view. Now we had these two that tracked all the way from the end, but I'm having second thoughts. I wonder if we create a perspective marker from the beginning, whether it'll track all the way to the end. Let's try that. Hmm. It seems to be going well so far, but it didn't go all the way to the end. But I'm going to keep this, actually, because it's a really good point. It's tracked throughout most of the scene. And it gives you that overlap between the first part of the scene and the last part, which can be really useful. Now, I wonder if we can add some tracking points to this couch. Because it doesn't look like it's very high contrast. It doesn't have big spots that you can pinpoint. But actually, it's very textured. So there is a lot of contrast within this couch. So let's see, Control t Yeah, so that's tracked really well. Let's play it back to make sure it's stable. Yeah, so when it's locked, that gives you a really good impression of how well tracked something is, because it looks like it's stationary. And that's perfect. Let's add some more of those. So I've gone to the last frame with Shift right. I'll make some markers here and here. I'll unpress L. Actually, I'll make these one at a time so that we can make sure they're tracked. So with this one, I'll press Control Shift T, lock it with L, and make sure that it's stable. So I'm just watching carefully to make sure that it stays locked onto that same point on the couch. Hmm, it's doing really well so far. I wonder if it makes it all the way to the beginning. Oh, no, I think it'll be cut off. OK, almost. Let's pick a point right next to that and see if we can get it to track all the way throughout the scene. So I've gone to the last frame of the animation, Control, oh, Control Shift T to track this point backwards. So the way you do this is going to be different depending on what video you're using. The most important thing is to do lots of trial and error, mess around with these settings until you find a marker that can track your scene really well. You want to have as many points as you can, really, as many tracking points as you have the patience to add. The more you have, the more stable your track is going to be, and the more realistic it is going to look when you add something into your scene. So that tracked all the way throughout our scene, which is perfect. Let's add a few more points. So over there, let's lock it to make sure it's right. And now I'm going to go through and make loads more points in the same way that we've talked about already. So that tracking point broke, even though it was still on the screen. The way I'm going to try and fix that is by making it bigger. And I try to do this as little as I can, because it will make this track much more slowly. But I think it's worth it sometimes to get a nice, stable point when you need it.
So my scene has a few more markers now, and it has enough markers at every point. So this should be enough to create a camera track from the scene. Now, before we do that, we need to look up the specifications of our camera and the lens, because we're gonna have to input them here under camera. Now it has some presets, but my camera isn't listed here, so I'm gonna look them up and come right back. So the camera I'm using is a Canon 70D, which has an APS-C sensor. So I'm gonna use Canon APS-C as the preset for sensor size. And then under lens, I'm gonna change the focal length to 24, because this is a 24 millimeter lens that I was recording on. You don't need to change these distortion values. You can keep them as they are. So now, here on the left, go down to Solve and click Solve Camera Motion. And you can see that it runs through and it gives you a solve error once that's done. 0 0.6224 is quite good. Anything below one, I think it usually is pretty good. But the best test of how good your solver is, is to actually see what it looks like in your scene. So let's create a very quick scene to test it in. You can scroll down and press here, set up tracking scene. Now it's made this scene, press zero to go to the camera. And you can see that the alignment is off, so it's not level with the ground. Let's select three markers which are perpendicular to the floor. I'm gonna use those three. And here I'm gonna press select floor. Now it's important that you select three points and not just two and not more than three. Now you can see that the floor is roughly level with the seat, which is what it's like in real life, that's perfect. Now we can press shift and space to make this full screen. And we can watch this back to make sure that the, all the tracking points stay in the same place. And they do. It seems to be a really good track. The way you can tell if it's not good enough is that sometimes the tracks seem to move. So what you need to do is watch this back for your scene and just look for anything obviously wrong. If there are some problems, there are a few things you can do. You can go back and add more tracking points. That often fixes things. You can check that you have the right sensor size and the lens focal length for your camera, because that's really important. What you can also do is check your scene for problematic tracking points. Now, let's, now I'm going to show you how to do that. Here, under Marker Display, click on Info. And you can see that every tracking point has average error, and it gives you a number. So this tells you how how well that track conforms to the rest of your tracking points. So does it make sense in context? And here on the left, you can see clean up and you can select a, a cutoff for your error. So let's say one and you can press clean tracks. Well, first deselect everything. Now select clean tracks and you see that it selects the tracking markers with an error above one. So some of these tracking markers aren't very good. I'm just going to delete them because they're not adding anything to our scene. And now I'm going to solve the camera motion again. And you can see that the solve error has gone down. It's 0 0.5697, which is lower than it was before. The scene here is still aligned with the floor, which is excellent. And I'm going to keep that. And now we can ignore our motion tracking. We can now go back to our scene in the default view and start playing around with it. One thing I forgot to do is I forgot to change it to cycles. So let's change that to cycles delete everything and create a new tracking scene. Now we have to select the floor points again, that's okay. Select these three. Actually, now that you have these errors, error numbers showing up, you can pick three points that have a really low error. So that's quite low. That's really low. I'm gonna use these three to, cr to create the floor. And now let's just check that everything's still okay. So if I go to the camera with the zero on the number pad and animate it with Alt A, you can see that everything is still synced. Before we move on, let's save our scene. Now we can go back to our default view because we are done with the tracking. And this shows us what this scene looks like. And now let's play around with this to make it a bit more interesting. Let's get rid of this cube because it's not really doing anything. 
Let's add a monkey instead. And let's grab it over there. If you've added enough tracking points, you should be able to tell what your scene looks like in 3D space from these tracking points. So you can see loads of these on the floor and loads along here. So you can visualize in your head what this bench looked like before. So I want my monkey to sit on the bench, but it's too big. So let's make it smaller. I'm going to grab it with shift. Oh. I'm going to grab it, shift Z, so locking the Z axis and rotating it in the Z axis. I'll see what it looks like in our 3D view. So if we render this frame by clicking render or hitting F12 on the keyboard, it's going to render it out. And let's see what it looks like. So that doesn't look quite right. I have a feeling it's because the monkey is in the second layer. But actually, let's move it to the first layer. We can do that by pressing M and clicking over here. And let's see what that looks like now. So you can see it's rendering the monkey separately to the ground now. And now it's rendering the ground with the monkey shadow on it. And when it puts everything together, it should look much better. So this is the monkey in, in our scene. So when you press set up tracking scene, what Blender does is it creates two layers. The first layer is layer one here. And it also adds some stuff into this layer underneath it. The stuff in the bottom layer is a shadow catcher. Everything in the bottom layer is going to catch shadows. And that allows your monkey to cast a shadow onto the real world, even though it's not actually doing that. Let's have a look at our rendered frame with F11. And you can see that the shadow doesn't look quite right because it thinks the floor is flat and it doesn't realize there's this wood up there. So let's add that in. We're going to select the ground plane, which is in that layer, and it's our shadow catcher. And we're going to rotate it in the Z axis so it lines up with our floor. And we're going to scale it down because it doesn't need to be that big. And now it's easier to control. Let's grab it, locking the Z axis with Shift Z, and see if we can get it to line up with that edge there. We're going to have to rotate it again so that the rotation matches exactly. Let's zoom right in, and grab it again, locking the z-axis. Let's rotate it one more time in the z-axis just to make sure everything's exactly right. And let's move it, locking the z-axis one more time. Now it's lined up with that axis. We can select these two points in edit mode, extrude them in the z-axis, so extrude them straight up. And now when we render, you can see it's going to render the monkey. Then it's going to render our shadow catcher, but it's going to be in the right place. So you can see it catches this crease in the wood. So you can see the shadow extends up as it should do. Now, if this monkey were bigger, that effect would be even more noticeable. Yeah, so now the shadow is looking realistic in this scene. To stop it being just a boring monkey floating in space, let's make it spin around. And this is really easy to do. Let's open up a new window and make it a graph editor. And now with the monkey selected, we're going to press I, add a rotation keyframe. And here, just delete the X and the Y rotation. Make sure just Z is left. Press N to open up this toolbar on the right. Click Modifiers, and add a generator. Now, if you animate your scene, you'll see the monkey spins around. Now, it spins quite quickly. Let's slow it down, I'm changing this X to 0 0.1. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, still quite fast. Let's half the speed to so 0 0.05. Now it's spinning nice and slowly. Let's give it some more interesting materials. Let's make it glossy. So I'm going to add a new material to the monkey and make this glossy instead of diffuse. Now, if we render this, you'll see that the scene is reflected into the monkey, but it doesn't realize what the scene should look like. So the monkey is just reflecting um, this plane, and it's not getting any real reflections from the world. 
It doesn't look right at all. The way we're going to fix that is by using an HDR panorama of our scene so that the reflections the monkey gets are the same reflections from our scene. I'll also include the HDR that I'm going to use in the description below. So to load up your HDR panorama, go to your World tab, click Use Nodes under Surface, and change the color to Environment Texture. And to do that, you have to click that little circle on the right. Now click Open and just navigate to your panorama. Again, I'll include this in the description in case you want to use the same one. Now, if you press Shift Z, you'll notice that the reflections are showing. So there's this nice red in our monkey, but we can't see the panorama. And we want to be able to see it for the time being to make sure the rotation is right. You fix that by going to the Render tab and under Film, tick Transparent. And now you can see the HDR panorama. So what we're going to do is make sure the rotation is correct. Now here, go to the Node Editor and click the World icon. So you can see that it's automatically plugged in your panorama to your background. But we want to be able to rotate it. So add an input, which is texture coordinate, and add a vector mapping node. Now we're going to plug this into the environment texture, and we're going to plug generated into this vector. Now, nothing's changed, but what we can do now is change this Z rotation to move our panorama around so that it matches the camera shot exactly. Let's go to our camera and select only the first layer so that the plane isn't in the way anymore. Let's make this transparent again, just to remind ourselves of the angle we're looking at. Now, let's make it not transparent and rotate this until the two match up roughly. Now you'll notice that this isn't a great panorama, but that's not an issue at all. You're not going to be able to see this panorama. It's just for the reflections. It's just, just to give a really rough idea of what the scene looks like. So it's this sort of rotation. You can see it's a completely different shot because it's a different focal length to the camera we were using. But you can see that roughly we're looking at the scene from this same angle when we turn transparent on or off. Just going to tweak it a little bit more. And that's good enough. Now, if we select all our layers again, you'll see that the monkey is showing this plane in its reflections. And we don't want it to. This plane should be there just for the shadows. We can fix that by selecting this plane and go to the Object tab here and scroll down. Now, under Cycle Settings, you want to untick Glossy because you don't want it to show in glossy reflections. And now you can see that the plane isn't shown in the monkey. Make sure that transparent is ticked and hit to render to render your frame. So you can see the monkey has these lovely reflections in it. One thing I've noticed is that we're spending a lot of time rendering these frames, even though they're not very important. I'm going to turn the number of samples down because it doesn't have to be very high for the time being. We can turn it up later. But now it's going to make sure it renders much more quickly. So you can see we have this monkey which has the reflections of the room in it. One thing we still need to do is sort out this pillar. So you can see that it's not blocking anything. The shadow behind it is still showing. And if we go back here to where the monkey is behind it, the monkey shows in front of it, even though it shouldn't. So the way to fix that is really simple. We're going to add a cube with Shift-A mesh cube and move this to the first layer with M and then clicking up here and move this cube to where the pillar is. So this takes a lot of trial and error. I'm going to scale it, locking the z-axis to make it the same sort of shape. And now I'm going to grab it, locking the z-axis until it's roughly in the right place. Now I'm going to animate, so press Alt-A to see whether this pillar stays in the, in the right place. No, the box seems to move out of place. So what I'm going to do is move the box closer to the camera. Now I'm going to move my view and left click right where the camera is. And that's moved the cursor to the camera. Now I select this cube and make sure the pivot point is 3D cursor. Now you can scale it. And it doesn't look like it's moving, because it's moving relative to the camera. 
But if you move it in a different view, you can see that you're changing the way the cube looks, but not in this view. And that's exactly what we want, because in this view, it's right, but in other views, it's not. So let's go to a view where it's correct. It's sort of drifting to the left. So let's, let's try scaling it down, 0 0.9, and just see what effect that has. So it seems to drift to the left more now. So let's try scaling it up. Let's try scaling it up 1.3 or around that. You can see that it locks on much better. Let's animate that to see whether it stays reasonably close. Yeah, it does. For the purposes of this tutorial, that's good enough. To get it any better than it is now, what you'd have to do is get a much better track and just fiddle around with this a lot to get it exactly where the pillar is. But for now, it should be good enough. Now, what we need to do, now this pillar is still, it's just an object in the scene, so it's going to render it in the scene. You see there's a pillar now. But that's not what we want. Select the cube, which is going to be our pillar, and give it a new material. And make the surface type hold out. And let's see what happens now when we render this frame. So I don't know if you saw that, but the monkey head was cut off. So you can see the monkey is hidden behind the pillar. It's not quite aligned, but it's roughly in the right place. The shadow isn't cut off, though. So the way we're going to fix that is by moving this cube to both layers. Right now, it's only in the first layer. So I'm going to press M to move. And if I click here, it's going to just move there. But I'm going to hold Shift. And now you can select both layers at once. So now you see when you select it, both of these dots are orange. And that's because it's in both layers at once. You see, most objects are in one layer at a time. But this is in both layers. So let's select a frame like here, press Fn, press F12 to render. And you can see the monkey was cut off. And this is also cut off. And so now the monkey and the shadow are cut off around the level of the pillar. So it's not perfect, but that's mainly because the track isn't completely accurate. If you want to do something like this, I recommend adding loads more tracking markers and getting a really stable track. There's one problem which we can fix, which is here, you can see that corresponds with the edge of our plane. So we're going to make sure that the edge of our plane isn't visible in our scene. I'm going to change this back to active element. And from our camera view, we're going to grab it in the local Y axis. And you do that by pressing Y twice. You can move it over there. Now, it's not covering enough of the scene because now it's not going to be catching shadows anymore. So let's go to edit mode, select everything by pressing A twice, scale it now in the local Y axis, and just add as much as you need. Now, it should be ready to catch shadows wherever those shadows are, and it shouldn't look odd. So I'm going to set this to render, and then I'll show you the final version. I'll also include the HDR that I'm going to use in the description below. Now, I have to make that panorama because it doesn't exist.